Is that plan enough? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's a lecturer in typography at the Reading, and he received a PhD and MA in type design. So uh, today uh, we will have him to have the talk with the title Decoralizing Ascenders and Descenders. Let's welcome. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Um, yeah, the title is uh, basically over there. You have all read it. And I'm going to quickly start because we are basically running late with this uh, session. Sorry. All right. Yeah, I tried to be. Is it good enough now? Yeah. I can be louder. It's, it's just. OK. Uh, in many of the world language communities, the spoken languages and their corresponding written system do not f uh, stem from the same linguistic or geographical root. Two of the world's most widely used writing systems, Arabic and Latin, are used to represent several languages of distinct families. From the 7th century and with the spread of Islam, Arabic began to extend its reach to different parts of Asia and Africa and Europe and beyond. In most parts of what is now the Arab world, both Arabic language and script gradually found dominance, while many speakers of other languages, such as Persian and Turkish, only adopted the modified version of the Arabic script. This cultural and linguistic diversity gradually shaped one of the richest, most elaborated, and diverse writing and manuscript cultures in the world. <clears throat> From the 16th century and the introduction of Arabic script printing with movable types, several Arabic script types were produced in Europe, most of which comprised of distorted letter forms and uh, had serious limitations in following the script rules. These typefaces are described by uh, Thomas Milo as Euro-Arabic. However, in the late 18th and early 19th century, and within, the short, within a short time span from the widespread adoption of printing with movable type in different parts of the Arabic script world, typography reached an unprecedented level of maturity and sophistication, which in some cases has remained hardly surpassed even today. This is particularly evident in various fonts of types which were produced in Istanbul, Tabriz, Tehran, Cairo, and Izmir, respectively. The subsequent introduction of lithographic printing was another high point in the development of a sustained print culture in the Arabic script world. In some countries like Iran and India, lithography became the preferred printing method and significantly contributed to maintaining the stylistic, regional, and linguistic diversity of the script. Lithography also offered an opportunity for new developments in the arts of calligraphy, illumination, and illustration. Artists and craftspeople who were uh, originally trained in various aspects of manuscript production, modified and employed their skills and knowledge to elevate the art of lithographic printing. Although lithography offered many advantages over movable type in the 19th century, it was not the most suitable printing technique for rapid and large scale production of popular journals and newspapers in the 20th century. This gradual shift from lithography to typography as the main means of printing various genres of texts in countries like Iran, however, was no good news for the visual identity of the language. With the introduction of mechanical composition, i.e. hot metal typesetting and Arabic typewriters in the 20th century, an abstracted and typographically simplified form of the script was devised and widely distributed which was mostly based on an understanding of the Nazca style. Since mechanical composition relied on imported Western machineries and fonts, the local contributions were drastically minimized and in some cases entirely suspended. As a result, such a heterogeneous and vibrant script culture was reduced to a blend of uh, um, uniform uh, characters defined by technological, economic, and political priorities over important social, cultural, and linguistic concerns. Ever since, technological limitations of the various uh, typesetting technologies, most of which are designed to primarily accommodate the requirements of the Latin script, have been influential in the development of the Arabic script typefaces of different styles. 
Most of the speakers of languages like Arabic and Persian gradually adopted the typographically simplified NASC-based typefaces, which were developed for hot metal typesetting machines like Linotype, Monotype, and Intertype. But this approach was not popular amongst the speakers of other languages, especially Urdu, which preferred the Urdu flavor of the Nasalir style. Urdu speakers retained the visual identity of their language and continued to predominantly use the lithographic methods of printing until the 1980s, when the first digital Urdu Nasalir typefaces were produced. Prior to the digital revolution, a few attempts were made to produce a simplified form of the Urdu Nasalir for mechanical composition. However, none was successful and their use remained extremely limited. Seemingly, both linotype and monotype companies were reluctant to produce typefaces specifically designed for languages like Persian and Urdu, since they considered the use to be restricted to those regions. When facing resistance, they often accused their clients of being biased or ignorant, rather than admitting their concerns regarding the scale of their profit. An example of this is presented in communications between Walter Tracy of Linotype and the company's representative in the Middle East in the 1970s regarding uh, the Iranian newspaper's request for original typefaces. When facing unwillingness from Iranian clients to purchase the already available Arabic typefaces, Tracy wrote, they alleged that the shape of characters is typical Arabic and not Persian at all. Unaware of the linguistic and stylistic preferences of Persian readers, Tracy adds, this is rather like an Italian printer or publisher looking at some Italian text matter and uh, complaining that it looks too English because it is set in Baskerville, a style of letters which has never been popular in countries which prefer Garamond and Bodoni. This is to say the people in Iran are not saying that they cannot read the type they are simply expressing an irrational prejudice, strengthened perhaps by the nationalistic factors of political or, or uh, emotional origins. While the comparison of the European typographic traditions with the Arabic script word is out of context, the real reason for Tracy's frustrations is explained in his final remarks, where he states, the prejudice is very strong and will only be dispelled as the appetite for modern equipment is increases. I think that for quite a long time, we may have to face demands from printers in Iran for typefaces particular to that country. And we will have to accept the fact that these designs will have no sale values outside that territory. There is no doubt that corporate monopoly over production of Arabic script typefaces has been instrumental in formation of an extremely unbalanced typographic support for many languages like Urdu. Reportedly, in the 1960s, and in a race to produce the first Urdu Nasalir typeface for mechanical composition, Linotype Company went as far as attempting a patent for the script rather than the type design system. This was considered a step too far even by the standards of Monotype Company, which itself had a record of copying foundry types of Istanbul and Cairo presses. In an internal company a memorandum, a Monotype employee stated, People have been working on this for 30 years, and there must be several versions of Urdu Nasalir about, and not patented because the individuals concerned would not consider it to be a subject of patent. I think linotype are behaving in a crabby manner. We would not dream of restricting the use of a system which will be of such tremendous benefit in education and culture in the Urdu-speaking countries. This is bareface hijacking, and I'm fighting man. Uh, it would be better if they tear up both of these patents and behave a bit civilized. Today, many of the technological limitations of the past have been or are being overcome by the... Uh, but there, there is still very little attem uh, attention paid to the typographic needs of various languages, which due to several economic and political factors are not usually taken into consideration. In addition, there are several company policies and approaches which impose Latin typography as a standard model to the rest of the world's writing systems. This includes the distortion of writing styles based on a particular understanding of typographic modernity, the stylistic and aesthetic hegemony of uh, Latin typographic conventions, shortcomings of typesetting and text shaping and font technologies. 
In my view, many of these are rooted in colonial system of power and dominance, which has uh, had devastating consequences for typographically under or misrepresented languages. One of the profound attributes of the colonial mindset is the racist sense of supremacy. This can be seen in the general attitude of colonialists towards the history, language, and culture of various communities in which they saw little or nothing of value. In debates leading to the English, uh, English Education Act of 1835, which supported the establishment of a Western curriculum with English as the language of instruction in India, one of its leading advocates, Thomas Babington Macaulay, whose minutes upon India education played an instrumental role in this transition, trans transition um, um, stated, I have no knowledge of either Sanskrit or Arabic, but I have done what I could to form a correct estimate of their value. I have read translations of the most celebrated Arabic and Sanskrit works. I have conversed both here and at home with men distinguished by their proficiency in Eastern tongues. I'm quite ready to take the Oriental learning at the valuation of the Orientalists themselves. I have never found one among them who could uh, deny that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. Western progress versus Oriental stagnation may not be as strong and bluntly represented as it was in the 19th century, but it is disturbing to see legacies of this sense of cultural supremacy in today's typographic discourses. The contemporary academic example of this approach in, in our field can be seen in English language articles and monographs on the history of Arabic script typography or printing, which do not consult a single source in languages that use the Arabic script. We see a prominent type designer and founder of a London type design company responsible for several high-profile Asian writing system typefaces who goes on record saying that it is time that some of these cultures, presumably Asian, were dragged screaming and kicking into the 21st century. He adds, many cultures from outside the Latin world never had their own Gothenburg. They have no typographic tradition. There is a huge calligraphic tradition. Their calligraphy is drop-dead gorgeous. But commercial printing didn't arrive in the Arabic world, for example, until the eight, eight, early 1900s, when likes of linotype and monotype started to export their machines out there. Apart from the fact that these claims are historically and factually inaccurate, what is truly aston astonishing is that they were made by someone with no authority over Asian writing systems and languages. This attitude is a product of centuries of propaganda and untested assumptions, including the one that frames printing as an agent of change in Europe and supposes its late adoption in Asia as a symbol of backwardness or cultural inferiority. Most inventions, however, are interconnected with others and do not occur in isolation. It is well established that printing with movable type was practiced in China and Korea long before Gothenburg. But let me slightly shift the viewpoint on this subject and ask, could Gothenburg's printing method with movable type achieve any success rate if paper was not introduced to Europe from Asia? Who could afford to buy a copy of Bible printed in vellum which required around 170 coffee skins. Regardless of the cost, could this be a sustainable and efficient practice? So why not considering paper as the real agent of change? After all, printing with movable type is only one of the many methods of duplicating text, and as a technology has no agency in and of itself. We cannot ignore the significance of local context, constraints, priorities, and needs. It is estimated that the cost of a single printed book from the first printing establishment by a Muslim printer in Istanbul, Ibrahim Mutafarrika, was equal to buying a horse, while at the same time, one could purchase a manuscript copy much cheaper. In the context of South Asia, Graham, Sh Graham Shaw uh, emphasizes the widespread and larger scale com commission, production, and dissemination of manuscripts which has been termed by Sheldon Pollock as the preprint publishing industry. According to Shaw, 
Print's power of rapid duplication held no appeal when there was already a highly developed information network underpinned by organized guilds of Muslim scribes, Kateb or Khoshnavis, with newsletters, Akbar, being regularly compiled and distributed by news writers in every corner of the Mughal Empire. Despite all evidence to the contrary, some scholars further suggest that the required skills for printing and typefounding were ex exclusive to Western printers. Even today, some use a similar narrative to undermine the contribution of Asian type designers, especially those without a European degree in type design or, uh, and who also work in the region. However, historical evidence proves that such Eurocentric assumptions do not line up with the fact. In the context of the Arabic script, engraving letter forms on small pieces of metal or stone was commonly practiced as seen in seals and coins of different periods. Knowledge of foundry, mold making, and casting was introduced to the region uh, long before Gothenburg's time. Despite the uh, common misconception, what is generally presented as Islamic calligraphy, or more accurately, calligraphy in the Islamic period, is not merely the practice of writing letter forms with reed pen, but involves various techniques of tracing, drawing, cutting, and engraving le the letter form outlines with utmost precision. Today, one of the most concerning trends in the Arabic type design is the obsessive appetite for homogenized multi-script typefaces, which mostly concerns an existing Latin typeface based on which other script typefaces are designed. This has reached a point that Arabic text typefaces, which may, ne which may never be used alongside Latin, are designed to reflect Latin proportions, stroke modulation, and other typographic attributes. Following a homogeneous approach to branding, usually parameters such as the depth of descenders and height of ascenders in the Latin typefaces are imposed as guidelines which result in distortion of letter forms and many structural issues. While the consumeristic attitude of more of the same is thriving in Latin type design, particularly in the con context of a corporate style branding, Many languages worldwide do not have a single typeface designed to reflect their cultural and linguistic requirements. Arabic type design largely follows the same trends, since amongst many languages that use the Arabic script, only one or two are usually considered worth investing in. Therefore, the growth we have witnessed in number of Arabic typefaces in recent years is most, mostly artificial, since it benefits the richest and more powerful countries. The historical prevalence and current tendency towards neutral, modular, and geometric typefaces are a pro product of a, a specifically European social, political, and cultural experiences. Many of the modern movements, like the international style and the Bauhaus approach to design and architecture, cannot be separated from the experience of two world wars and the disastrous consequences of historically untutored nationalist movements and racist rhetorics that Europe experienced. Not only is this sense of universalism and homogeneity discriminatory and insensitive, but it can even be fatal. Imagine a homogeneously designed type family for road signs in a region where three or four writing systems are used. A driver who is reader of uh, one of those languages or writing systems and should identify it in a fraction of a second would need to make an extra effort to find and read important information on the road sign, delaying the reaction to possible danger ahead. I have first-hand experience witnessing how the absence of Persian keyboards on mobile devices forced users to transcribe Persian in Latin characters, which is called Pinglish. This practice became so popular that many thought that shift to Latin script would be inevitable. But when Persian keyboards were made available and companies like Apple finally graced users with a virtual Persian keyboard towards the end of 2017, this trend almost entirely disappeared. The situation is still green in the context of several other languages. It is disappointing that currently there are only a handful of semi-functioning open type Nasalik typefaces available for Urdu, which is the 10th most widely spoken language in the world with around uh, over 250 million speakers. That's half of the population of Europe. 
Although some blame that they consider complexities of the writing styles for a scarcity of typefaces, many of the existing limitations stem from shortcomings of font technologies, minimal support on various digital platforms, and more importantly, lack of investment and understanding of the script rules by designers and engineers. What makes this situation even more frustrating is that other advanced and well-informed methods of handling correct form of the Arabic script writing styles digitally have been available for years. But such independent efforts are often sidelined by major tech companies' policies to exclusively support their own approach and certain font technologies. For instance, Decotype's advanced composition engine, ACE, and their design scheme is perhaps the most suitable available system that renders various Arabic script writing styles in accordance to the script rules. This is small company's focus on computer mo models of the script system rather than the type forms not only allows the correct implementation of features like elongation or keshida, but also follows an elaborate design system which relies on pen strokes and components, which they call glyphlets, rather than the metal type legacies. However, even when such flexible and powerful design and text shaping system with its important advantages is available, without the investment and support of the bigger industry players, it cannot be fully implemented to benefit hundreds of millions of users. We cannot wait for the voices of millions of Baluchis, Kashmiris, Uyghurs, and Kurds, some of whom are under severe economic, cultural, and political pressure to reach us before we can uh, consider their basic typographic needs. Are members of those communities capable of affording such high conference fees, travel and accommodation costs, and visa restrictions to participate in English language conferences in the most expensive cities around the world? As members of design communities and tech sectors, it is our social duty and professional responsibility to use our privileged positions to exp and expertise to provide effective tools of textual communication, while bearing in mind that typographically underrepresented languages are not a playground for amateur type designers with no script expertise to impose their uninformed uh, perception of a stylistic and aesthetic modernity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very impressive, especially from my eye as a Chinese, <laughs> from such a global view for this, uh, the whole summaries. So, um, uh, we can have some Q and A. If yeah, if anybody have the questions. I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take a precious. <laughs> oh. Okay, hold on. Hello. Hi. Do you think it would be time for an Arabic script specific conference where we can all get together Just and Yes, yeah, there, there have been ones, and I, I agree. I think yeah. we need a bigger, to, bigger, to, yeah, bigger of coverage of languages. And I, I totally agree, but we are, are sorry, our, our projections are going to be isolated. We need people from Apple, Microsoft, Google to listen to us. Also. And if we just, you know, have these kind of conferences, I just wanted to use this platform because I know there are a lot of decision makers around here and they might watch these kind of uh, conference presentations. Uh, I think uh, for providing better, you know, uh, textual, uh, sorry, contextual material for Arabic type making to make it easier for students and people who are researching the subject to, to basically have platforms, it's absolutely necessary to have uh, specific, you know, conferences, the specialist conferences. We had one in Istanbul, Onur Bey, who is sitting here. He organized a fantastic conference, which, by the way, was free of charge, they paid for our accommodation and flights, we went there, we presented, they were amazing hosts. So um, there, are, there are issues that uh, we can only discuss in such multicultural, multi-discipline you know, uh, platforms. And I think we uh, all work in individual, uh, as individual units. Uh, perhaps also my follow-up question is, 
shall we get together? Uh, and I think by collaborating, we make it easier for people who follow us in the future generations. And I meant to say thank you for your uh, very impressive talk, Borna. It's really a pleasure to hear your words. My pleasure, yeah. And I'm, I'm all for collaboration and uh, discussions. I think yeah, we have already started having a lot of discussions. We really need to open up the, uh, basically the views of what Arabic script is and what languages require. We have issues within the context of Arabic language and Arabic script, sorry, Arabic script. We know that some languages are not receiving any attention. We know that there are over 100 languages that historically or currently have been using Arabic script, but most of the typefaces are designed for one or two of those languages, yeah. Hey, Borna, thank you for your presentation. My pleasure. I'm going to have a bit naively or maybe controversial question. So if you're thinking about um, Italian cursive copper plate uh, calligraphy, and then you think about grotesque, grotesque Latin typefaces, and then you think about Nastalik, and then these digital ways of sans Arabic, where is the difference? What would you say that, where is the difference between Latin digitalization and Arabic? You are talking about uh, how Latin typography was evolved into this new sort of more uh, sort geomet. of is and why that is not accepted in Arabic. I just want to or compare those. Yeah, uh, is maybe more. It's, it's yeah. Maybe. The comparison okay. is a little bit tricky because I also am critical about the way that Latin typefaces are designed. I think that they are predominantly designed for Western European languages. We don't design Latin typefaces specifically for non-Western European languages. And uh, I have heard uh, justifications for this. I'm not convinced. I think that when you are covering so many languages which are using the same writing system, you make compromises. It's impossible to design something that works well for German as well as English, even in the context of Western languages, Western European languages. You know, the frequency of capital letters in German. So even apart from that, uh, I think what is uh, very important is that what is uh, basically presented as a typographic heritage or typographic diversity in Latin, you can find in writing styles in Arabic. I'm not talking about calligraphy, I'm talking about writing styles. And if you look at lithograph publications, you often see lithograph publications including at least five or six writing styles, which exactly fun function the same way that you perceive Roman, upright Roman and Italic. Because these are two different writing styles, you know, mixed together to give that kind of text hierarchy. You can find it in Arabic, it already exists. And uh, when it comes to basically stroke modulation, which is essentially what uh, sans serif, you know, and uh, typefaces that are called modern are about, uh, then the stroke modulation is not a big deal. It's the distortion that is the problem. Once you start applying the proportions of Latin to other writing systems, and as I said, you know, the depth of descenders, the height of ascenders are defined by what Latin allows, then you get into troubles of distorting other scripts and writing systems because you want them to basically fit in the same box. Whereas in Arabic, there is cascade. How are you going to you know, reduce it into a linear form without distorting the script? And what, what are you adding by doing that? I mean, the, the Arabic has a lot of uh, features, a lot of features that really aid readers to better read and better understand the context. And although I don't have anything to back this up, but I think this kind of neutralization and simplification might have something to do with the rising number of dyslexic people. Everything is super simplified, super homogenized. It's just one of those things that even in the context of Latin, I think we should start rethinking how we are designing all these neutral typefaces. So. Yes. Yeah, definitely we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.